So if you're in practice uh, today as a financial planner or a financial advisor, this episode is going to blow your hair back. Uh, my guest this morning is Ian van Skoer, the CEO and founder of AdviceWorks, and we're really looking forward to chatting to him, and we're going to get into all of the major events, trends, and things that are shaping the advisory landscape. And one of the things that I noticed definitely is how quickly things are changing, and they are continuously changing, and keeping abreast and keeping up is extremely important uh, when you are in practice and understanding where things are going. And in my mind, doesn't matter whether you are an IFA, but particularly when you're an IFA, and then uh, even if you are tied and uh, you're working maybe in a franchise model, there are loads of things that you need to be aware of. What is driving uh, all these changes and where they come from? I'm going to get into some interesting questions, uh, sort of looking at where things are going, how the business models support this. And then I want to ask Ian, if Ian was to do this, like if he has to start a small practice today, what would Ian do? So uh, join us for this morning. Uh, really looking forward to this. And let's get into the show. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome back to another day, another show, another Friday. Uh, this is episode 34 or 194 since we started back in 2020. Can you believe it? I was doing some stats in a document recently, just seeing what has transpired over the last three years. It's absolutely mind-blowing. So uh, to each one of you, thank you very much for the support. Thank you for being here on a Friday, for watching the recordings, and uh, for supporting us in, in what we're trying to achieve through this show. So as I said, my guest this morning is uh, Mr. Ian van Skoer. He's the CEO of AdviceWorks, and we're going to get into some very interesting conversations this morning. He has loads of things to share, things that he sees, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's been incredible doing the prep for this and just seeing what's what's coming up. So don't miss this. Then we have uh, uh, Nikki back. Uh, I almost said Lalani. Lalani is not back yet. Uh, Nikki is here from the FBI talking about current affairs and sharing what the latest things are. The Norma uh, is also getting into how self-control can increase certainty, which seems to me like a very interesting topic. Then I've got a big announcement that I want to make. And uh, then I get into the conversation with Ian. So that's what today is going to be about. Uh, so do stick around. Enjoy the morning with us. Uh, but before, of course, I've got to say good morning, good morning. So good morning, Quibus, working from home for a change, your own home. Uh, and then Terence, good morning. Good morning, Terence. Uh, hope you're well. Harry, good morning. Looking forward. Thank you. Albertus, uh, good morning, Albert. Hope it's going well. And there by you, Mark. Always going well with you. Uh, I don't want to assume, but but I guess it's always going well there. Uh, Renee, good morning. Nice to see you. Uh, David Kopp, good morning. Nice to see you. Yoni uh, Tad was awesome. Um, you had to see in your uh, week. So in person, all the from Natal So thank you very much for making the time. Uh, good morning to you, uh, Philip. Good morning. Uh, nice to see you back again this week. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got Barry van Niekerk. Barry, I hope it's going good. Uh, Louis, my machtig. Yeah, that's the only way I get Louis on the show is if I if I invite Ian to come onto the show. Thank you, Louis. Um, I, I do owe you a coffee. Uh, Louis, good morning. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Sima, good morning. Nice to see you as well. Neil Phillips, good morning. Uh, becoming a regular again. Uh, and Jakub Ritz, good morning. Hope it's going well. And Alfred, also awesome to see you. Uh, welcome to, to the show. Alrighty, guys, thank you very much for saying hi. Remember, you're welcome to share in the chat, talk in the chat. Let's keep to the topic at hand and uh, let's uh, participate in, in today's show. Right, with any further ado, let's head on over to Nikki for Current Affairs. Good morning, Franco, and good morning to everybody listening. So SARS is clamping down on non-compliant non trusts. The South African Revenue Service is moving towards an environment where all distributions and vesting amounts from trusts to beneficiaries must be reported to it on a real-time basis. Currently, SARS requires banks, financial institutions, medical aid schemes, attorneys and estate agents to file third-party returns once a year, shortly after the end of the year of assessment. The plan is to extend this submission obligation to trusts. Following an analysis of the, compliance, the tax compliance of trusts and their beneficiaries, 
found significant non-compliance and such has it created an interim online registration platform for trusts to register for tax purposes. It has also threatened non-compliant trusts and beneficiaries with civil and criminal sanctions, the imposition of penalties and interest, and the raising of estimated assessments if any non-compliance is not remedied. Then Banking Group Capitec has been granted a license to conduct life insurance business in South Africa and is planning to start underwriting its own life and funeral insurance products soon. The group announced this week that the South African Reserve Bank's Prudential Authority granted it the license, which will be effective from the 3rd of October. Capitec has been offering funeral and credit life insurance products since it first dipped its toes into the sector in 2017 and 2018. It has been offering these products through two sell captive agreements with the underlying policies underwritten by licensed sell captive insurance. But proposed changes to that regulations and strong growth in the number of insured clients prompted Capitec to apply for its own life insurance license, the bank said. The new license has been granted to Capitec Life, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Capitec. And then in the last section, with Reserve Bank Governor Lesecha Kanayo pointing to further interest rate hikes in the coming months, new data from the National Credit Regulator shows a rising trend in the number of rejections in credit, rate applic in credit applications as South Africa's middle class feels the pinch. The big interest rate Cuts that followed the pandemic shock spurred a sharp rise in demand for credit as the economy gradually reopened. However, the pace of this increase is now tapering off as rates continues to rise. So the rejection rate on new credit applications has risen slightly in recent quarters. It was about 57% average in 2019, and the last figure in quarter two of this year is now 66.7%. These rejection rates reflect lender concern about the credit worthiness of low to middle income consumers, where job and income losses due to the pandemic continue to be relatively large. And then just a comment from FBI's side. It is your last chance to grab an in-person ticket for the FBI convention at Indaba Conference Center here in Johannesburg on the 19th and the 20th of October. There are only a few places left. The theme of the convention is the time is now, and we are very excited about our lineup of speakers. Virtual tickets are also still available. Um, registrations close next week, Friday. So for more information, please email events at fbi.co.za or visit our website at www.fbi.co.za. And with that, may you have a wonderful weekend, Francois and everyone who's listening. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, yeah, I'm also going to be at the convention. So, uh, yeah, I hope to see you there. If you haven't got a ticket yet, do consider getting one and uh, I, we can have a chat and spend some time together. So uh, do do that. All righty, next up is Norma. And Norma, as I said earlier, is going to talk this morning about how self-control can increase certainty. And uh, Norma, over to you. Can't wait to hear what you have to share this morning. Good morning to everyone. So I'm sure if you follow Francois on uh, social media, you would know that he has been marketing a five-day challenge that I've prepared for the propulsion community. So this challenge isn't necessarily uh, about goal setting, but let me just give you the topic first. So the topic is all about um, goal cultivation. So this is not another goal setting course. It's really about preparing our minds before and during, so pursuing the goal. So if you um, want to go and learn more, just go to these uh, platform and or maybe go to LinkedIn, all the information is there. So this is really what sparked the topic for today. So the topic for today is that self-control increases our certainty. And I think about goals a lot and 
the we want certainty when we think about the goals. If we don't have that certainty that we're going to get to the goal, we're not likely to even pursue the goal because we we tell ourselves, I don't want to waste time or I don't want to be disappointed. So I'm rather not going to even set that goal. But my question today is, uh, what is where does the certainty come from? Because 99% of the time, we haven't done that ever before. That's why we set goals, is because we've never done that before. And we don't know the how, but we have the certainty that we're going to figure it out. We're going to try a whole lot of things, and we're eventually going to get there. So sometimes we don't even want to consider setting the goals, as I've mentioned, because we don't have that certainty. But what gives us the certainty? And for me, looking at self-control gives me that certainty. Because I don't know how to exactly get there, but I know that I'm going to try and I'm going to figure things out. And I know that I've got that inner knowing, that I've got that confidence that I, um, I'll be able to do it. So let's look at the self-control part. The self-control, according to, again, Google and what, what it defines it as, is our ability to control, particularly our emotions and desires, especially in difficult situations. So it's that emotions and desires that, get, that gets in the way when we are looking at our goals. Because think of your business, for example. Um, I don't want to set big goals in my business um, because I've got this doubt or I've got this insecurity. Or when I set a goal, like a weight loss goal, for instance, I have all of these urges and desires that gets in the way of me getting to the goal. So it's not the certainty that gets me to the goal. It's really what I can do and how I can show up to this goal that gives me that certainty. So when I don't have that self-control, this is when, as I've just mentioned, I set a goal like a weight loss goal. And I can't, um, I've, I've got this cupcake in front of me and I, and I, can't, uh, I, don't, I've, I can't fight this urge to eat this cupcake. So for me, in order to get to my goal, I need to say no to this cupcake right now. Another example is in our business, for instance, if we set a goal of, let's say, multiple six or seven figures in our businesses, we have this doubt and insecurity coming up, and we think that's a way for us to stop. Uh, we think, you know, I'm not smart enough, I can't do this, I don't have the recipe to get there, I'm just going to quit. So the self-control part is really the part that is so important, because that really is the thing that either takes us to the goal or makes us stop and not even pursuing this goal. So how do we get to a place where we have the self-control? And I don't think it's, it's really that, that difficult because uh, sometimes we think people with self-control are born with it or they have this, some special gift. And I think self-control all starts with us keeping the promises that we make to ourselves. Um, look at the people that achieve their goals, that set the goals and achieve them. Those are not necessarily always the most smart people. Those are the ones that have the self-control. So when the emotions come up, I'm frustrated today or I'm disappointed because I tried this thing in my business and it didn't work. Those people just make that mean that I have to try it another way. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm not capable of getting there. So keeping the promises I make to myself, if I say I'm going to do something, I stick through and I, I make sure I do it. So this self-control can also become this rules in our lives. This is like our, our guardrails. So it's not negotiable. I do it no matter what. Even if I don't feel like it, I still go ahead and do it. And also, I think just making sure that we change the story we tell ourselves. So if we think about our goals again, a lot of times we say to ourselves things like, yeah, I'm just a person that loves food and that's why I can't lose the weight. Or I'm just a person that I don't think I'll be able to do those type of things. It's not because it's not in your ability, it's because of the story you keep telling yourself. If I keep saying to myself, I love food and that's the reason I can't uh, lose the weight, it just increases my desire for that thing. So that's what I have for you with regards to self-control um, and how that at the end really determines if we get to the goal or not. Not necessarily the certainty we have in reaching the goal, but the self-control, because that's really the only thing we have control over. So that's what I have for you today. Thanks for being here. I will we'll speak to you again next week.
Thank you very much, Norma. And do I have urges and desires? Uh, so self-control is uh, <laughs> something I clearly need to work on. Uh, but thank you very much, Norma. That was extremely insightful. I'll also share a little bit more about the goal cultivation challenge in a second. Uh, but before we do, let's get started uh, with the with the quick announcements and uh, the first big one. So this is, I think, a massive one. There's an email going out at eight o'clock this morning as well that will uh, inform you and the links and things I'm going to share today uh, will be in there. But uh, we are announcing our next big event, which will be on the 7th and 8th of March uh, next year, 2023. Uh, it'll be completely virtual and completely live like we did at the summit. But this one is going to focus all on technology. So the theme for this is adopt the future today. Uh, as you'll hear today from Ian as well, how things are progressing and how quickly it is and how important uh, different aspects of technology is. So really getting uh, I'm excited to get into it with him. But uh, save the date. Uh, there is a link uh, that you can uh, just go to. It is in the description here on the YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, if I can just find it, where did it go? Here you go. Uh, so you can just go to propulsion.co.za forward slash tech and uh, it'll give you the option to add it to your calendar very easily. So please go and do that, uh, propulsion.co.za forward slash tech, or in the description, just click the link, and you'll be able to at least just save the date. So the tickets will go on sale uh, shortly, uh, and uh, we will let you know. So keep an eye on our social media and all of the other stuff, uh, all the other places where we do communicate with you. Uh, so please do that. As I said, it's going to be completely live-streamed, and we're going to do showcases, demos, uh, we're going to have panel discussions, keynotes, and Q&A sessions. And it's going to run over two mornings. So it's not the entire day. It's two mornings from nine until one. Uh, so just important that, uh, you know, and we're going to have sufficient breaks in between and all of that. So that's why we decided to run it over two mornings. Uh, so big, big, big value for money there. If you're a Propulsion Pro member, you just get a ticket. So don't worry. Uh, you don't need to buy a ticket. It's included in your membership. So you'll be able to to attend that. Uh, if anybody's interested in sponsoring this or know of people that should be getting involved and uh, should be sponsoring this, uh, can also get in touch with me. And uh, you can contact me via LinkedIn or email or WhatsApp, whatever details you have of me. Um, if you don't have anything, then LinkedIn, I suppose, is the easiest. So Propulsion Tech has been announced formally now. It's out in the world, 7 and 8 March, 2023. Uh, 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Righty, so uh, we really hope that you're going to share. What we are going to do, let me just say this in closing about this, is that this isn't only uh, about, it's not only about the software. We're going to have hardware, software, data, cybersecurity. So um, we're going to really cover a lot of things that are very important to you um, from a technology point of view. And whether you're a one-man, one-woman business, or whether you're a big, big FSP, like we've got something for you that you can take away and go think about and implement in your business. So do join us for the 7 and 8 March 2023. All right, then uh, the next one that I want to announce, uh, obviously now, is the five-day goal cultivation challenge that Norma just mentioned. Uh, again, this is for Propulsion Pro members only. Uh, this is five days, but it's a very interesting way now Norma has structured this because it's not five consecutive days. It's every second day, so it gives you enough time to do the work. And it's not like full days that you need. There's short little videos and a little bit of text that you need to read in the morning. And it gives you a worksheet and the sort of things that you can do. And by the end of these five days, you will have uh, sort of completed this. And as, as you said as well, it's complementary to goal setting. So this is not a goal setting challenge. And the whole idea with all the challenges are that we want to help you implement. We want to help you get there and do it together with other people who's almost like, you know, going through the same thing as you or they want to learn the same things. You're there to support each other. So that's awesome. Um, I think these challenges that we're doing are extremely successful. So do make use of them uh, if you're a Propulsion Pro member. If not, go check out Propulsion Pro and consider joining. It's 350 Rand a month or 3,750 Rand a year. So uh, you're more than welcome. You can just go propulsion.co.za forward slash pro. Uh, so easy peasy. Then uh, the last thing uh, that I've got for you for the quick announcements is that just a quick reminder that the featured section, which is now today's Ian coming up, is released on our podcast as well. So if you do want to listen to this again, but you don't want to watch the video, you just want to listen to it while you're doing something, do go and subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, we are on Apple, obviously, 
Uh, you can find us everywhere, trust me. Um, so we've been around since 2019 with the podcast. So do go and subscribe to that and uh, share the podcast. Uh, we really appreciate it. And also the show. Um, we have managed to grow. We are so close to 1,100 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please do subscribe. Like this video. If you like what we're discussing today, like it, share it. Help us get the word out uh, because we want to reach more and more people with this uh, and have an impact. Uh, as if you've experienced the impact that this show has, help us do that for other people as well. Alrighty, so ladies and gents, with that, it's time to introduce you to Ian van Skoer and have a riveting conversation with him. Riveting is my favorite word, so uh, let's get into it. Righty, so uh, Ian, back in 2011, left uh, Liberty at that point in time. He uh, has been a third generation uh, from his family that have been serving the Standard Bank Group over many, many years. And uh, after 19 years at uh, the Standard Bank Group and Liberty, he decided to venture off, go sit on a beach, write a business plan, go fetch some capital. And he started at Viceworks together with some of the guys in his team. Um, and today I know, I just heard recently that the last member from that original team has now also joined AdviceWorks. So everybody's now at AdviceWorks and they've really built an incredible business. I've been fortunate to host some of their conferences or MC some of their conferences. And you get to hear a little bit of things that obviously you can't always talk about because it's inside stuff. But it's amazing, like uh, what they're building, their vision, where they're going has been absolutely incredible for me. And um, it's, a, it's a big, big honor. I mean, they've now got 150 uh, partners, as they call them, 150 uh, practices that operate within their framework. They've got about 60 offices around the country. They're managing like 40 billion rand in assets under management. So absolutely incredible what they've done since 2013 when they, when they, when they got going. So Ian van Square, a warm, warm welcome to Propulsion Live this morning. Thanks, Francois. Good morning. Morning. How's it? Good stuff. Do you also get like, uh, like <laughs> when people introduce me, I get like uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> Is that okay? Now, now I'm more nervous about talking to Norma about self-control. I think that would be a much uh, bigger problem. I'm fine with you, Francois. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah, as I said, a warm welcome. Thank you for your time. Uh, I want to get into it because we've got a lot that I want to talk to you about this morning. And um, there are some great insights here and things. And obviously, this is all about the changing advisory li landscape. It's something I spoke about in the last two episodes to some degree as well. Uh, but today we can really get into what are driving these things and what are you seeing from where you're sitting and building the kind of business that you are. Uh, I think you may be noticing trends that some of us that's maybe closer to the ground in some sense don't always see um, be because we don't go that high to see what's happening over the horizon, for example. So I want to start off with the changing advisory landscape. And, and my question is, what is the main driver at the moment? Like, is it, is it the profession itself doing great stuff and this is causing this to evolve? Or is it the consumer that's driving this? Or are there certain events that's happened? I mean, what are the things that are driving the change that we're experiencing currently? Yeah, Francois, it's an interesting one because I, I think we started noticing some change back in kind of uh, 2000, or I started in about 2010, 11. You know, we started seeing a, definitely a... a, a um, I suppose what you'd call a tilt in the landscape as, as new capital regulations were hitting South Africa, SAM and Basel. And, you know, the new capital regs, uh, following new capital regulation, you usually see a change in distribution regulation, and that was coming in, in RDR. So I don't think it started now. I think it started way back. Some of that was the reason why we actually wanted to start a, you know, a company like AdviceWorks. But I think today, I think the, the change is, is, is much more profound in the sense that it's that complemented by a whole lot of other things. So I think we've got huge event driven um, factors influencing the change in, in, in advice landscape. So, I mean, we if you just think of COVID and the, the client engagement models, if you think about even the service models by product providers today, you know, these hybrid models, everyone thinks they're great. Sure, I, I went into a, a product provider the other day and I had to send them a note and tell them that I thought they were closed for business. So some of these things, you know, that's event driven. I think capital markets have been tough. We've been through a terrible socioeconomic 
uh, kind of time over the last 10 years from a, from a South African perspective. I think, I think um, capital market performances are, are, are having a big impact on the way consumers are behaving. I think, you know, even at, at the advisor level, commission rates have fallen. Uh, it's much harder, and I think the cost of doing business. So we got a we got a we got a wave of, and and not necessarily the uh, it's probably the right stuff, but but it introduces costs. So a wave of um, compliance driven regulation. You think of of Poppy, you think of AML. All these things are coming, and then and then the digital era has has you know has created its own its own set of uh, of challenges. So. You know, uh, just just the massive increase in cyber crime, uh, fraud, and the cost of encryption and, and and data security. You know, it's pretty hectic. And then and then we got load shedding. You know, so that's not great. So we got load shedding on top of that. I mean, I think I think for small businesses it's tough. And then you just look at the regulatory environment. So audio, I think, is a big positive. So we're trending there, but it's been slow. But I think the internationalization and the regulation driving internationalization of assets, which again I think is positive. So so from the right place, but but it's really changing the way advisors have to you know, I suppose equip themselves and create, you know, international capabilities that are robust. So so they having to reinvent themselves. So and then we've got this thing that I call the great resignation out of the, the US, which is which is people moving. I, I, I'm seeing a decorporatization trend as people are going, you know, what's the meaning of life? Uh, I, I want to be in an owner managed business. So, so you're seeing all of these things. Um, yeah. On top of that, claims increase, you know, the, the, the relevance and importance of health and insurance uh, just through, a, through an epidemic. I mean, so all these things are hitting, I think they're hitting financial advisor businesses yeah, you know, head on. So, so I think we've seen some long-term structural change, and now a whole lot of event-driven stuff impacting everyone. Dan, I think in some way, shape, or form, it feels like COVID was the trigger, but it wasn't. It's just like I think it has accelerated many of these things. These things have always been around, so it's either accelerated them or it's magnified them almost, or, or I don't know, boosted is the right word, but just made them bigger than that what they were going to be at this point in time probably and uh, i've been meeting now with with a lot of small fsps at the moment and having interesting conversations with them um i mean i'm, I'm thinking about something like uh, you talk about how we've gone digital and the virtual and the hybrid thing is yeah. you know data and how concerned the small ifa is about data and the data security because like even in my business right i sit with a lot of data and things but i don't have the knowledge to make sure that this is behind a proper login and it's so locked away that nobody can get to it and yet even those businesses sometimes still do get hacked that they do have those kind of things um you know but i mean that is a major thing and this comes at a cost yesterday i was meeting with somebody saying you know they're paying so much for their it people and i'm like holy moly that's a lot of money and they're small fsp you know so so there's a lot of costs that have come as a result of these things and and we don't have a choice i don't know like you either get need to get on board or get out almost um you know you, you don't have a choice so you can either decide you're gonna weather the storm and, and and sort this out yourself or you can decide to make other moves or you can decide like i've had enough um and and for most of us we haven't had enough we we're still here for the fight and um but these things are, are absolutely critical um just maybe quickly from a from a um the role of technology just very quickly um, i mean it is great the fact that we can meet like this now and i mean if i had to go this morning to your office or you had to come to my studio kind of thing you know you, you would have cursed more <laughs> because it's it, like it's all this further driving it's all this stuff so there's some benefits there but but also then from a from a from a technology that enables this kind of thing um i mean what are some of the the biggest changes that you've seen um that you know is this something because the consumer wants this or is this something that we now decided yes i can save a lot on fuel i don't need to drive to clients anymore like like this whole technology versus productivity versus being hybrid thing like like just your view on that yeah francois i think there are two pieces to that so i think there's the digital client piece so so the, or, or the engagement piece yeah I, you know i think i think it's here to stay i don't think that um I think it's come through the COVID era, as you said, but I, I think the I think the digital engagement pieces are here to stay, and I think the the organisations that had embraced call it the future uh, of client engagement, uh, you know, we're in a 
probably a very strong position as you went into COVID and have probably done quite well. I think the trick going forward is how you humanize that. So it, it's great, you know, that we, we, we replace face to face on an engagement basis. Um, but, but I think you've got to humanize it. So how you touch customers, uh, product providers, you know, everyone. I think you've got to work out how you humanize it. So, so yeah, I think it's here to stay. I think it's changed stuff permanently. But the second piece on technology, it's not just about the engagement pieces. I think, I think technology, insofar as its role, and I see, I see your new um, summit, your announcement on the sixth and seventh of March is spot on. I mean, I think, I think technology itself, and the role of technology in everybody's operating model is just, is just somersaulted because, you know, as we see all this change, you've got to become more efficient. You just have to, yeah. um, and and, you know, if you go down the technology road a little bit. I think the you know each it what I've learned over the last few years is just how different each practice is. So every advisor practice is is unique. So so what a technology solution that might work for I don't know person A isn't necessarily right for person B. So so the technology pieces are, are quite tricky because I think they're built these days in component parts. So so you you find tech that's uh, created for a piece of the value chain. So, so, you know, as you look at your operating model, you've got to be quite clear about what you want. And then you adopt technology that suits you. But I don't think that's the, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's sort of the holy grail in the technology debate anymore. I think, I think component technology is important, but I think it's moved beyond that. I think the integration technology between components is where the real efficiency lies. So the businesses, so, so uh, you know, a financial advisor today, I don't think he's just got to be good at understanding his own practice and understanding the technical part of a, a component of a technology kind of improvement that he wants to make in his business. He's got to understand data and technology architecture because it's how he pieces it together. So I, I, I listen to these technology debates a lot. And, you know, Stuart Porrell's quite quite outspoken on it, which is always quite quite amusing, to be honest. But, but yeah. I think... I think his stuff is all about integration. So if we've learned one thing on the technology piece over the last 10 years, it's it's about the integration between the component parts that really set you free and, and create the efficiencies. So for, a, for an advisor sitting at the back, you know, in his business, not only does he have to understand the, the component parts, how it works, what the outcome is going to be, he needs to have a unique understanding of his own peculiarities in his practice. But He's got to understand the architecture and, and Francois, that's hard. So it doesn't surprise me why the technology debate reigns on is, is there an ultimate answer? There probably isn't. The ultimate answer for me doesn't lie in one technology solution. It, it lies in the ability to integrate all of the pieces you apply. So, so for us, that's been the biggest challenge. Yeah. And it, it, it's quite interesting because uh, there's a couple of things involved in that process and, and where the hardness comes in or the challenge comes in or, or, or the frustration comes in for, for the smaller business is also, and I had these discussions plenty of times the last two weeks, is they don't have the resources, they don't have the time, they are already a slave in their business, they they've almost feel like a prisoner and now when must I get time to do this stuff and figure this out and learn the technology and, and all of this kind of and it, it, it's, it's actually it, it's, it's weird because the, the technology is the one thing that can give you back your time, but it's first going to take a lot of time before it gives you back time. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a two way street then and, and some sacrifice that needs to happen. Um, yeah. but let's get let's get into some hmm. yeah, sorry, you want to add. Yeah, I just wanted to say that's the oldest debate in the world, you know. So when do I stop and invest to create a, you know, a future benefit? So, so my, my advice is that the technology changes, are, 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 you know, just the improvements have created an opportunity for, you know, prof to professionalize a practice. It's come on in leaps and bounds. Actually, I think you have to do it now because I think you're going to get left so far behind. So I think you actually have to make the investment of time, Francois, for every advisor. Uh, if there's one piece of advice, I'd, uh, you know, our experience has taught us anyway, uh, is, yeah, make make the technology investments now. Don't don't wait. I don't think you can afford to. 
Yeah, and I'm so glad you call them investments because I've been hoping on it. It's not a cost; it's an inv- for the right technology. It's not, Absolutely. and also that that sounds to me like advice that works. So I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's, let's see what you did there. <laughs> I was sharp, eh? Um, <laughs> let's. I want to get into some major trends. I mean, the, the, this thing that we just discussed, the technology is is, is absolutely one of them. Uh, but but another big thing is sort of the polarization between different models because. As I mentioned earlier, people have got to make a choice. Do I stay in my business? Do I join another business? Do I go tight? Do I leave the industry? What do I do? But that's one part of this. Um, what are you seeing from like, how do people, because polarization means I either go here or I go there. There's, there's not much in between. There's literally like one of two things. And, and what are you seeing from, from that point? You know, Francois, I, th- I, think, I think we've been seeing that for a while. I mean, I think, I think the socioeconomic stuff has, has Yo, I think it's been hard on consumers and investors. So I think our people are, uh, they're a lot more conscious about saving. So so the market performance, capital markets performance, COVID, whatever, all those factors we were talking about earlier, I think have made people much more aware um, of the need to to be conscious about the way they save. And so, so what we're definitely seeing is a polarization of different models. So we're seeing what I'd probably call deep-seated advice and relationship models on the one hand. Um, and, and, and I think that's right for a certain segment of markets. And then we're seeing, um, so, so advisors either go that way or, or, or they're trending into what I'd call much more needs-based production orientated uh, financial planning. So, and, and neither model is necessarily right from a commercial perspective. I guess it, it's gonna come back to your value system. What is it you wanna build with clients? So, you know, if, if you wanna, if you wanna do financial planning and solve for needs, that's fine. It's much more transactional oriented and maybe you're good at it. Um, other people might have a different approach, you know, so, so we're definitely seeing consumers or a, a big segment of consumers move towards deep seated advice models. So they're placing much greater emphasis on quality of advice. Um, and I think, I think that, that that category of, of consumer is very focused on who they, you know, who their advisor is and what their processes are. And, and with that, probably more holistic based financial planning. So lifestyle financial planning, I think is a wave and a trend that's, that's been forced through, well, maybe as a consequence of the necessity of, of people being, uh, of it becoming more important to manage your savings pool better. So, so definitely those two poles, we, we, or that polarization we're definitely seeing. And we've been seeing that for quite a while. Yeah. And, and as you said, like, you know, it, I guess when you start any kind of business, you need to decide on a commercial model, business model that sits behind that. Uh, and, 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 and I want to get into a question around that a little bit later. But, mm. but I think that's ultimately, you know, and, and whether you then go and say, oh, I only work with this type of client or I work with everybody, which I, I don't always believe working with everybody is such a good idea when you're small. Um, you know, I think ultimately what will happen is you start out small, you work with a very specific group and as you grow and if you grow a bigger business, you'll tend to start working. Like I think always think about Amazon. So they started off just doing books and as they grew, they now do freaking everything everywhere in the world. So mm. it's just it's just one of those consequences of building a big business. But when you start off, you can't be everything to everyone. You need to decide like to be everything to someone. Um, I think we, we spoke about that uh, when the Money and Medicine guys were on here. But ultimately that's the important thing and too often specifically people that 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 focus a lot on the human side and 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 the people and the advice and the relationship versus the transactional kind of approach that you just mentioned is that they do want to help everybody they they almost feel obligated um you know to, to to help everybody in the same way so i think that's also where technology can play a big role and say if that's what's in your heart and that's what you want to do it doesn't make it wrong you could be more efficient. You could be looking after less clients with bigger like returns on your on your time and your and, and whatever. But ultimately, um, you know, you might also use technology to serve those people that is not so profitable, and you still fulfill that sort of need. Um, so I think that's also a big part of this because some of these things that one wants to do and that's on your heart is not always profitable. And I think that's the you know that that's the hard thing, like specifically when you're a smaller business. Um, anyway, I just want to throw that in. I'll get to the question in a second or in a minute or so. Um, then the the whole thing, you mentioned this earlier about going digital, digital engagement specifically. Um, I mean, what are you seeing from a 
I mean, what's happening in, in AdviceWorks, for example, where you have, I mean, you have advisors across the spectrum, um, you know, so from a face-to-face -face meeting with a client point of view versus just doing it digitally versus having sort of a hybrid model, where do you think the answer lies? Um, and what are you seeing? Or what, are, what are consumers wanting? Or what are your customers looking for from, from that point? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think the answers are, 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 not, are not clear, Francois. So, so we're seeing a bit of both. We're seeing a lot of advisors wanting to, to get back to events face-to-face, -face, uh, sorry, clients and advisors. And then we're seeing a whole other group where, you know, they've, they've, they've actually quite liked the digital engagement now. I think, I think the fundamentals are you need to be able to, to give clients um, options. So, so I think you've got to offer both. I, I, you know, I don't think that there's a one size fits all anymore. I think this digital kind of engagement is it, it, absolutely it's repivoted uh, the starting point. So, so the the one piece that I'm absolutely clear about and it, it has been a standout for us too is is responsible and accessible. I, I think you've got to be sorry, not responsible, responsive. Uh, responsible probably important too, but <laughs> responsive and accessible. Uh, I think are the key. So, so the client communication pieces today are ten times more important than the the client communication pieces of yesteryear. So, so in other words, and, and a, a big barometer for us is how many people are reading our, our automated client communications, Francois. So, so I mean, a few years ago, we were seeing the same as kind of product providers. You know, your of your client base. 60 70 percent would be trailing through your, your your monthly or daily or weekly client comms which has to be digital these days i mean it's got to land in an inbox or on a cell phone now we're up to over 90 percent, but i think that takes time um so so i think how you touch that customer i think you've got to create options how you touch that customer has got to be unique to what the what the client wants advisors themselves are, are, are trying to work this out so i don't think the answer is clear yet what i what i am clear about is you've got to provide You've got to provide options on digital engagement and complement it certainly with face-to-face uh, um, -face events. And the key critical thing is you've got to be able to touch these these clients. You know, I, th I think we can touch a client now 80 times a year without seeing them once. That doesn't mean you mustn't see them once. You've got to, but you've got to have that capability. I think it just it just creates trust and confidence at the client end, particularly if you can complement that. Um, you know, you know, with, with with a sense that you're accessible and you're responsive, I think it makes a huge difference. And I guess a telling metric in that is because let's just say, for example, touching a client 80 times through various different means and ways and things that you can do of which one or two or three of them or 10 of them might be meeting like this. Um, yeah. uh, if, we, if you say seeing, you mean in person. Um, yeah. But I mean, j just from that point, um, I think a telling metric would be how much does the client engage back with you or getting caught, yeah. like how many times do they touch you basically? Yeah. Um, okay, I think that's a telling tale because we can send things 80 times a year to them, but if yeah. we never get a response, you never get a reaction, then, you know, we, we should probably be asking questions. I mean, is that something you agree with or what is your view on that? Yeah, I'm sure you're going to ask me the data question a little bit later. So I'm going to save yeah. that for then. <laughs> but absolutely, you You've got to be monitoring your 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 client engagement. Your apps. So as you move towards being becoming more client experience orientated, if you don't have the data to measure how responsive you really are or how responsive they are, you know you're kind of lost in the wilderness, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so so just quickly, I don't want to hop on on this trend too much, but I mean, there's been a major shift in the focus of the industry. Uh, what are you seeing from from that point of view? Just just briefly. You mean about uh, when you say focus, uh, you know, uh, advisor practice focus, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, so if you talk advisor operating and client service uh, okay. and engagement Sorry. models, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, I've noticed a sea change, Francois, and I, I, I've noticed it on your show. I mean, I noticed it in your announcement just now. Um, you know, if you go back and have a look at all the summits and the, I don't know, let's, let's just call them the events. You go back a few years ago and and all the events were kind of focused on high macro planning issues and uh you know alpha generation by you know how good is that investment manager on on generating alpha who's the best underwriter i think the the emphasis has changed completely i think we're seeing a much deeper focus on advisor operating models technology in 
in how advisors are adopting and restructuring their businesses to better service clients. I, I think the yeah, you know, just go and have a look at the agendas. I mean, it's it's a different it's a different discussion. And if you boil it down, I think I think what a whole lot of people have realized is that the emphasis for financial advisor practices is how you better serve the client. And I think that's fantastic. The advice pieces are important. Who's generating great alpha is important, but it's a small part of it's a small part of advice. It's an important part, but but much more important, I think, is how you structured and how you've positioned your business to better service your client. Definitely seeing it, seeing it on your on your show, seeing it in financial planning summit, seeing it across the board. So so very much much more client centric and and around how advisors can better you know, kind of better serve them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and the focus has definitely shifted because I don't know previously practice management stuff wasn't something that was that was you know you talk about that I don't know everybody it's like para planning and there's a few things in this in this profession where everybody's got their own definition of what that means but we've been hopping on it out and, and at, at the summit we actually spoke about uh, you and I a little bit in that panel um, around the importance of of you know managing your business like a business even if you're a one man one woman show. Like you've got to put that hat on. You've got to have the systems and the processes in place. Maybe not to the degree that an advice works uh, would have, for example, but you need those things uh, in order to to build a business of value. Um, but my next question is around, and I had a discussion with someone yesterday, very interesting enough, like how many clients are currently leaving South Africa? And do I know people in the UK, um, for example, that can help his clients? to you know just so that he knows they will be taken care of they will be in good hands they don't need to go to some website somewhere and this is something that's definitely happening so so what are you seeing from an immigration i think you put it so eloquently earlier it's not only clients it's also their wealth it's the money that's immigrating as well you know so sometimes people are maybe staying here but sending their money offshore and other times both of them are leaving um so yeah. so what do you think from that perspective yeah uh yeah, it's a tough one, Francois, but there, there, there are probably a couple of pieces to it. So, so definitely, you know, regulation trending to permit greater uh, internationalization of assets. I think that's good. Um, but, but what it means for financial advisors, they, you know, they need they need to professionalize their skills and capabilities to manage that. So, so greater exposure to offshore assets. You're going to have to build a deeper competence as an advisor to give great advice on on your international portfolio. So, so I think that's one. Um, I think we're seeing a, a, a very interesting trend. Well, two other ones, but the other one we um, we seeing is a lot of wealthy South Africans immigrate, but they want to keep their South African advisor. Uh, it's it's a great trend. We like it, and I, I think it comes from historic trust confidence. But that means you've now got to create a capability where a South African-based advisor has got to provide um, advice, call it digital engagement, because you can't see someone every day, digital engagement um, with somebody that's immigrated and continue to provide a professional service. So, so that capability um, and, and ability to do that. So, so call it a, a much more robust international capability is important. And then the, the other, the third piece that's very interesting is we've got advisors immigrating outside of South Africa, looking after their South African client bases. So we've now yeah. got guys in Belgium, uh, Portugal. Portugal um, yeah. I don't know. Some of our advisors seem to love Mauritius. So I keep on going, wow, okay, guys. And then you've got to go paperless. You've got to go digital. Your operating models have got to work. So, so, so we're definitely seeing a trend where advisors come back. So they work in these mobile models. They come back, but they've got to be efficient, right? They come back and see their clients in an engagement process. Otherwise, they're touching them differently. I, you know, I was asked the other day, you know, what we expect to see over the next few years. It wouldn't surprise me if 25% of, 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 of our advisor base is in a, um, call it a domicile outside of South Africa in the next three to five years. 25% is a lot. So I think you've got to enable that and we've got to be mindful of that. Um, and, and that's about sustainability. So, yeah, big, big trend. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people, I think, I guess, are just moving from Joburg down to Cape Town, which is which is almost also like working from you know somewhere else. Um, so it is, and I've had these discussions yeah. many a time as well, where people, is yeah. it possible? Can I do that? All my clients are sitting here. Yeah. And, and I and guess. I, sorry, I think yeah. you can, Francois. So we see, yeah. we've seen lots of that. 
So the, the intra-South Africa move, I think, is easy if you create an operating model that, that, that enables that. I think the harder ones are as soon as you go cross-border, it gets tricky. Sure. Uh, and, and specifically, um, you know, if you, uh, I think when you stay here and clients leave and, and they move to the Portugal's and, and those places, mm -hmm. and then, you know, are you allowed to give advice from here or can you only look after the South African thing? So it's not only having a capability to maybe do transactions that kind, but to actually to spend advice. Uh, dispense advice um, over there as well. So, so there's a lot of moving parts to that. Um, I, the last sort of major trend I just quickly want to talk about, Ian, is uh, just in the interest of time, is uh, succession. Obviously, it is a big thing that we've been talking about a little bit on the show the last couple of episodes. There's some episodes coming up. We're going to delve a little bit deeper into all of that as well. But I'm curious from your point of view, you know, succession. What are the trends in succession? Um, there's certain things that I've seen, and I've certainly seen an uptick on this because every week somebody on LinkedIn is saying, "Oh, we bought this book. Oh, we merged with this one. Oh, we did that. We, we see it now every week. It's, it's not a, it's, oh, that's cool. It's not even cool anymore. It's just everybody's doing it. So, um, what are you seeing from from that point that people need to take note of? Yeah, pro pro probably a caution, front. So, the worst succession model I think you can have is where you're trying to negotiate your succession when you want to leave. So, so. <laughs> So I think you've got to have, I mean, I think succession models are becoming absolutely critical and it doesn't, if you think of all the changes, people immigrating, you know, I think succession models are, uh, and we've been saying it for a long time, are becoming fundamental. So, so yeah, su su succession, I think, has to be managed very carefully. But I think a succession model is not something you decide at, at the last minute, just before you want to retire or, you know, or leave. I think a, a succession model needs very careful. Um, it needs to be it needs to be architected really carefully. I think it's got to be determined up front, and a succession plan takes a long time. So, um, and, and I think you mentioned it earlier. We found the the this massive emergence uh, of practice management, which you were talking about just now. So, a practice management framework. For us, yeah, you know, practice management, when you talk to people, you know, you start seeing people yawn, you know, and you just couldn't get it going. But as soon as you link practice management to the quality of a business and the quality of a business informs your succession model and your succession value. So you almost intertwine the two, integrate again is, is maybe the operative word. If you can create um, an ability to, to formalize a qualitative ongoing assessment of a practice, so the quality of the practice, to inform succession. We've seen an explosion in practice management. So, so people just focusing on building better businesses because it becomes so important in your succession transaction. And then I hope you're not going to ask me about data because data then becomes critical. So let me jump ahead of you there quickly. You if you haven't built the data engines to actually analyze uh, um, the information flow in, in practices, it's very hard to build a qualitative assessment to a practice. So our biggest investments at the moment are in data architecture. Um, and then you need to almost create AI or algorithms or, sure, if you like, some kind of data integration or architecture engine that can deliver intelligent, intelligent data so that you can actually digest that data, come up and, and give a credible reliable qualitative assessment of a practice that advisors can rely on to make a succession acquisition or particularly for buyers you know they, they need to know what they're buying so so those have become interlinked practice management succession data management i think the big relief in the data piece maybe it's not relief maybe it's the trend it's the biggest trend we're seeing francois is data analysis um intelligent data I think it's still at the advisor level, but for businesses migrating to client experience, it's going to evolve there. I mean, so so that's where we're we're investing all of our um, all of our, if you like, big capital and time and effort is actually in client data, because we think the next step is is going to be in the the client engagement and experience models. And you and it was your question earlier. You've got to know what clients are saying. So sorry, I jumped ahead of you there before you caught me no, on data. No. But I think I think those three things are becoming absolutely critical. And everybody has always thought about them slightly differently, I think. That they, they they're they're kind of juxtaposed and, and critical, I think, in that succession transaction. At the end of the day, if you run an independent financial advisor business and you want to retire one day, 
you, you want to know what your business is worth. So I think these succession models are set to become probably the most profound part of an advisor proposition going forward. Yeah. And, and, and there's a, it's just two quick things that I want to add there is oh. the one is that you want the data to come alive and show you the story it's telling because looking at the data is not going to, going to give you that. So you need that sort of pictures and, and sort of things that you can really make sense of this data that you're looking at. Otherwise it's just a lot of numbers mm. swimming. Um, but also, you know, often uh, it doesn't matter whether you're again, a one man, one woman business, uh, you need the data, right? So, in a business like AdviceWorks, for example, I mean, you can invest heavily into into this and you do, and, and there's a bigger game behind that. Uh, the small guy goes like, geez, like I can't afford someone to do this for me or what. There are solutions that at least, at the very least, if you want to manage any kind of data, because it doesn't help you saying you've got a great business, you've got to be able to prove that you've got a good business. And the only way to do that is data, because you can't argue with the data. It start with revenue management. So if you look at those kind of things, understand your revenue, and having commission statements coming from all over in a spreadsheet is not going to give you that. Um, so, so, so that's one place to start. Would be my advice for the smaller IFA. Um, so, cool stuff. I don't have to ask you the data question. Then we, we're all good here. Um, I want to quickly. There's there's two other questions I want to ask you. Uh, the one thing is just something that I've been noticing a lot over years. Not not just now. Suddenly, it's um, because being advice led and. And, 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 you know, being client centric and, you know, focusing on the human side of things, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are, are, are now common day, sort of the new thing for many people. Um, but what are the things that I've seen before with many of the corporates? Um, and, you know, they, they start using these, these words because that's what clients want to hear. That's what advisors want to hear. And, but you look under the hood and then ultimately the business model, in other words, how the business generates revenue, isn't directly linked to that because the way that the industry and even the profession still works from a revenue point of view today is either commissions it's or it's assets under management there's a small percentage of people charging fees and charging fees successfully in most cases they only charge a portion of their clients probably a fee um, and and often they just fee based right so so it's not fee only um, and, and I've said many times on the show is that it's also not about how you get paid. You can't distinguish your business through how you get paid. So whether a client decides they, they're happy to pay commission or they, they're happy to do it as a of management or they just want to pay a fee, I mean, that's up to the client. It doesn't make your business better than someone else's business. But we also know that how you generate revenue is driven by the actions that you take and what you focus on, et cetera, et cetera. So in my mind, there's a disconnect between the two still today, and there's a big disconnect. But I'm keen to sort of hear what you're saying, because there's definitely this thing where people are focusing much more on the client. They're putting them first, the client experience, client and all that stuff. But how does the business model or how can the business model support that? Because I think most people's challenge is how the hell do I now make money offering this new value to a client? Because most clients are not willing to pay for it, from my experience. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question and a tough one, to be honest, um, Francois. I think you've got to know what you want to be. So that's the starting point. And when I say you've got to know what you want to be, I, I think from a client perspective, not from not from a, you know, a commercial perspective. So you've got to start off saying, well, what is it I want to be to clients? And then, I, and, and then I think you've got to work a commercial model after that. So I don't think you must do it the other way around. And that's quite an important point. Um, you know, I also think that quite a few... Advisors are trying to distinguish themselves in their charging structures. Uh, I'm not sure that's the answer. I, you know, so differentiation is obviously important. I think you, I think you got to be authentic. I think you got to work out what you want to be at a client level, and then you got to build your commercial model off the back of that. So, uh, by way of example, AdviceWorks philosophy: we we offer fee based and 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 commission based. So, so and but but very much service fee orientated. So so we're very much about deepening the client experience. Our view is if, if you want to deliver um, a quality advice outcome for a client, it's very expensive. You need technology, you need integrated technology, you need great people, you need para planners, you need, it's an expensive model. But we're not shy about, um, about the fact that we're happy to charge, um, you know, trail fees that, that, that some might regard as quite high. But here's the point. 
we absolutely promise to deliver the client experience and a quality client experience. So, so, so we're not trying to we we're not trying to um, provide a Woolworth service and 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 pay a checker's price. Absolutely not. We are proudly about delivering a quality of adv advice process. But then you 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 better deliver that, and that better be in your promise. But then charge accordingly. So, for us, I don't think it's a universal point um, that that every client wants a lower fee it depends what proposition you you're providing and what service you're providing and and, and what resources you're putting how professional you are in your engagement uh, you know if i look at the just the uk and 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 um what commission models have done in the uk at, at an advice level you know more and more those are the types of um of commission lines that are holding up uh you know you're seeing a contraction of portfolio management fees, uh, other other providers on, on in the value chain. But if you're delivering a quality service, you, you need to charge for the service service you're charging. So I think the long story short, work out your client service model, charge accordingly, but then you make sure you deliver what you promise. Like any good business would, right? Uh, so well, they thought so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's actually it, it makes sense. And again, like I just want to reiterate, it's not about how you get paid. It's like, can you deliver the value? And is it worth the price you're charging? How they pay you for that? Uh, you need to be able to prove that you're worth what you get paid. How you get paid is actually irrelevant in, 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 in that sense. That's perfectly put. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> I had some time to think about it when you were talking. So, um, Ian, Ian, here's the question to you. Right. Oh, yeah. If you were to start a practice today but you're not allowed or you can't you don't you you can't build an advice works right so you can't go out uh get capital have a great business plan you can still have a great business plan but you must either self-fund or start with nothing how would how would ian do that today i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna cross swords you there francois i'd say i'd join a network like advice works and build it from there but but i, I know that's not really your question so so <laughs> well, that is one um, of the options right so i beg your pardon I said that's one of the options. So yeah. absolutely, <laughs> you know, it's getting so expensive that that honestly, if you want the capabilities, I, I really would. I would join a network where I can tap into capabilities. But if I had to start, I think your question really is: if I had to start a, a small business as an advisor today, what would I do? I think the first thing I'd do is sit down and spend a lot of time. And I'm not sure everybody does this. And I, I would I would strategically work it work out what I wanted to build. And I, I would be very deliberate about that, taking into account technology integration, those kind of pieces. Um, I would, you know, and, and the digital piece, I, I would I think very carefully about how I was going to service clients. The second piece is I'd go out and I'd find the right people to help me do that. Absolutely. And I'm not talking about how it, it might be one or two people. I would definitely not not do this alone. I would do this in conjunction with 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 some skill just to, you know, even if it's just to bounce stuff. Um, so, so people, I think, is important. And then I'd, I'd be very, very deliberate about selecting preferred providers. I would choose a selection of preferred providers. I would, I would digitalize it as much as I could. I'd embrace the new technology pieces, and I'd build it with a couple of good people. I wouldn't do it by myself. Um, and that's what I'd do, Francois. I, I would start like that. I don't know if that helps, but, but no, I'd start like that. No, that's amazing. And um, I think you've, you've touched on a couple of very valuable points there, you know, know what you're building, know where you're going, do it with great people, consider the technology. Um, and oh, no, I can't remember, there was one other thing you said now, which like just, but oh, the, oh, the, the, preferred, the, the preferred providers, those are the big things because a lot of people feel if you're independent, you have to have contracts with the world. And that's absolutely not true. Um, so, so yeah, so those were extremely valuable. Thank you very much, Ian. Sure. Ian, um, yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, or you know, how do they get in touch with with you or with Advice Works? What, what would be easiest? Yeah, I mean, uh, Francois. So, so the website's there. There's a there's an open comment portal. Uh, you know, any anybody who would like to ask any questions, you know, please feel free. Um, absolutely. Cool stuff. Ian, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. It was awesome, awesome speaking to you. The time flew by. We're a little bit over time, but nobody minds because it was so valuable. So thank you very much. And I hope to do this again in the future. Thanks, Francois. Thanks very much for hosting me. Thanks very much. It's a big pleasure. Thank you, Ian.
I literally have got goosebumps, like literally, like it does a lack of a discussion. Uh, thanks again to Ian for his time and for all the insights. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we'll be back. You guessed it. <laughs> Next week, same time, same place. Uh, you know, stay safe, be blessed and prosper. And remember to always continue to raise that bar. Thank you.